I've been interested in um, dirigibles and uh, rigid airships for a long time. And I have a book I've read about it, and I've gathered some information. So this presentation will be about the Graf dirigible, Graf Zeppelin, rather. And Bob was nine years old when this was first made. So I don't know if Bob remembers it. Yes, I do. <laughs> oh, wow. Go ahead. This is before the Hindenburg. Everybody knows what happened That's to the Hindenburg. That's why he didn't want to miss this today, because yeah. he said it was like always been interesting. And the interesting thing is that um, Lakehurst really played a very significant role in this, uh, the whole airship business. The, um, the, the Graf Zeppelin that was uh, named after uh, Mr. Von Zeppelin, but he died in 1917. So really the development was after that, and it was uh, from another man whose name is... Let me find it. What's Dr. Eckener, and he was a PR man for the Zeppelin company, but he became, he took it over basically. And uh, I was just reading this morning a little bit, he was really not a supporter of the Nazis at all. And at the end of his uh, career with this company, he was basically booted out and the Nazis took it over. But, so, And he was very friendly with Americans. He had a lot of American friends, this, this guy, um, Eckener. And uh, he had a relationship, Goodyear Rubber Company was in, and, you know, so there was a lot of American supporters for this, uh, this airship. So let's learn a little bit about it. It started in 1928 and only lasted nine years. And let's see if I can get this working here. Oops, jumping around. Okay. So um, what's famous about it is it was there were other airships before it, and of course the Hindenburg was after it. But this was really the most successfully commercially uh, made Zepp uh, airship. Uh, it was German built and operated, as you might realize. It was named after Ferdinand von Zepp Zeppelin, who was the founder of these airships. It was the, really the, the most well known for carrying passengers. They literally carried thousands of passengers. Uh, first transatlantic, made 140 crossings of the Atlantic. People oh, wow. can't believe it. Mm. Uh, it was really the American round the world flight was 1929, and it was um, supported by William Randolph Hearst. Uh, we can learn more about it. He gave $200,000 to handle all the, the uh, media part of it. Uh, it went back and forth from Europe down to South America to Rio on a regular schedule, carried air mail and all sorts of things. Uh, went to the Mediterranean, like I said, went around the world. Um, all the way to Tokyo, uh, across the United States, about 13 different states. <coughs> Altogether, about 590 flights, covering a million miles. <coughs> oh, I press the right keys. Okay. Now, there's a kind of a route, uh, route it took. It went from <coughs> the Mediterranean down over the Canary Islands, down the coast of Africa, and then to Rio. And then it would come back uh, up to Miami. At one point it went to Miami to uh, the Chicago World's Fair, and then it made regularly uh, stops at uh, Lakehurst. And that's the original German map, was Jawohl. still a German for Pacific, for, for peace. I don't know much German. How long, how long did it take him to do that? Let's in the Oh, let's see. I have some information. Um, Still in Russian. Let's see. Well, for example, um, the first uh, October 1928 was the first translation transatlantic trip. That was 6,200 miles. It took 111 hours. It only went 80 miles an hour, top speed. Um, probably going back the other way, it was quicker, right? Air jet stream. Okay, so here's a profile. Look at the length of this. It's two mm. football fields, more than two football fields long. Amazing. 100 feet in mm. diameter. Mm. Isn't that incredible, the size of that? Yeah. Wow. Now, the, big, the Hindenburg was larger. <laughs> the big problem on how to contain the hydrogen was that 
molecules and go through everything. We'll get that. We'll get to yeah, that. Okay, good. good. <laughs> yeah, they could, but, yeah, the Americans had a different idea. Okay, so duralulum, duralumin. Say that word. That's a good one. But anyway, the riveted girders are like a giant erector set. That's what I look at it. And steel wire. It was the stretched version of the Los Angeles. Now, does anyone know what that Los Angeles was? That was after World War I. There were reparations. And Germany was required to build airships for France, England, and the United States. So the one that went to the United States was called um, LZ-126, the one before the Graf Zeppelin, and it was renamed the Los Angeles. Uh, hmm. The frames were approximately 15 meters apart, and the interesting thing, blau gas, which was what was used to run the engines. What was, is it? It's in water. Uh, it looks like water. It's not blue, even though blau looks like blue. It was a gas, like a propane, the same weight as air. And so Union Carbide made it work for Germany. And eventually, later in the, uh, as the war got closer, they made their own. Uh, it's similar to propane, then. Yeah. It, it was used for heating and lighting. We, I have more on that. Here's Duralumin. It was, uh, I think, invented in 1906, patented in 1909 by uh, Alfred Wilm. Um, Fred, you might be interested in this. What it's, it's got 4% copper, magnesium, manganese, iron, and silicon. Hmm. Uh, but that's, that was its ad on the right I found is in the uh, UK or England. And uh, that's what made it work. Hmm. And like I said, it's like a giant erector set. Isn't that amazing? Wow. Amazing. <coughs> That's amazing. And it's another view. And I found this. This shows the difference between the gangway, which was in the green, in the center. This is where the crew members would <coughs> go back and forth to the different parts of the airship and the rings. And it shows the size relationship of person that's in the yellow. Hmm. It's one million rivets in each area. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Filled lifting cells, tremendous volume, 2.6 million cubic. <coughs> but there were also 12 gas cells just for the fuel for the engines, <coughs> another million uh, cubic feet, <coughs> plus 18,000 pounds of gasoline. They had emergency generator as well as regular other generators, other engines. Um, the the five engines also ran on gasoline or the plow gas. Lifting capacity, 192,000 uh, pounds, 33,000 payload, which I think is like 16 tons or something. The range was uh, 10,000 kilometers, which is pretty amazing for that time. Yeah, but but you look at the, the crew versus the number of passengers. I mean, it was almost double the number just to make it work. You know? <laughs> This talks about Blau gas. It was invented by Herman Blau. It, uh, 
the real advantage of it were twofold. One, it was free of carbon monoxide, and second, the buoyancy. As it was consumed, consumed by the engines, you didn't have to keep adjusting the uh, buoyancy of the, air, of the uh, airship. Uh, and you adjusted the buoy buoyancy by uh, venting hydrogen or dropping water. So five engines. And look at these engines. V12, water-cooled, reversible. Fred, how do you make an engine go backwards on purpose? With difficulty. <laughs> wow, I can't imagine that. Um, the range was, uh, let's say, 118 hours, just 100 on um, plow gas alone. Not a very fast vehicle, right? <laughs> and here's a construction picture of the uh, using duralium to build the. I wonder what they weigh. Probably not tremendous amount. Some pictures. I think when the Hindenburg came along, they went to a four-blade propeller, similar engines. <coughs> sound. After the bell signal from the commander, the motors are started and well off. That's pretty good. Five hmm. of those. Fire them. We'll see that again. Did they have an engineer in each? Yes, I think so. I think he had earplugs. What do you think? <laughs> After the bell signal from the commander, the motors are started and well off. Gondola, this is the part where the people were in. So a single gondola structure toward the first third of the airship. Later on, the Hindenburg had it flush with the bottom of the airship. This one, the whole thing extended down. The front of it was a control room, and after it was, you'll see in a minute, it was navigation room, radio room. There were 10 passenger cabins, kind of like Pullman cars, like on a train. Um, it's sitting dining room, dual wash room, for men and women, uh, toilets, galley, the the cruise quarters were within the ship. You had to go up on a climb a ladder, go on these gangways all the way to the back of the uh, airship. Um, let's see, there's the passageways, and there were large windows, and the windows were not just for the passengers, but they used them for navigation. Here's a diagram I found. Actually, the one I found online was all in Portuguese, so I had to do a little work to fix this up. Uh, you can see the front on the right where it's curved. That was the front of the, that's where the control room. And what was interesting to me, there's no seats, there's no chairs. So they were standing all the time as they were operating all the controls. You'll see in a minute. The radio room is behind the um, map room, I guess. I see. The galley was in the between the dining room and the control room, and in the back of the airship was the restaurant. There's another diagram. You see, the entire structure was below the airship. As I said, in the Hindenburg, it was more flush. It's an outside view, and the large bulk thing hanging down I think was like a shock absorber, like it, when it landed, it uh, hmm. deformed and it was like a shock absorber. If you look on the right, right in the center, um, you'll see that there's a folded um, air generator. It's like a wind generator. There's one on either side of the ship, one for the radio room and one for the galley. And it would produce electrical power. Hmm. Hmm. There's a view from the bottom. You can see all five engine cells hanging down from here. <coughs> Flight controls were rather strange. They were kind of like a cross between an ocean-going ship and an aircraft. And the rudder uh, and elevator were actually wheels, large, almost like a steering wheel. The um, gas and water ballast controls were on the left. You'll see it here in a minute. Engine telegraphs were used. I think they were like 
uh, indicators, they might have been electrical or mechanical, that would signal the mechanics of each uh, gondola of each engine what to do. You know, start, stop, speed change, reverse, and so forth. Many, many instruments were used. Um, the echo lot, does anyone know what that is? Have you ever heard of that? That was a sound type altimeter. It would shoot a shell down the bottom, out from the bottom of the aircraft. And if they measure the time before the sound echoes back up, and they figure out the alternative. I did read that they used to drop bottles and use a stopwatch to see how long a bottle before it hit the ocean. And that would help determine their height. So that was just as well. There's what it looks like. No seats. Everyone stood, I guess, right? Like a ship. Yep, like a ship. There's the map room, and you see there's a ladder going up to the uh, cruise border. Now, the electrical system, they had two main power plants within the hull, and they would burn either gasoline or blow gas. The uh, wind generators were, as I mentioned before, they would be swung out in flight. The, um, there was also an emergency generator. I'm not sure where that was, but it was somewhere there. Batteries were used by the radio so that independent of the wind speed, the uh, voltage would maintain the correct level for the radio operators. Uh, as I said, the galley had a stove, two, bur two burner stove, hot water heater, and refrigerator. I didn't know they had refrigerators in 1928. I thought they were still using ice boxes, but they had one. Radio room had uh, high-tech uh, two, six tube receivers. Do you know what that was? Greg, what's a six tube receiver? Six valve. Six valve, that's right. <laughs> <It's European. laughs> that's right. And the direction finder had a loop antenna, if anyone knows what that is. Maybe that was in that bottom bu uh, bubble. No, that wasn't there. Because you need the antenna. There's, there there it is, right there. There's hmm. what the radio room looked like. It's state of the art radio equipment for 1928. Hmm. By the way, those refrigerators had SO2 instead of Freon. Ah, very good. Hmm. Very, th very thrilling and exciting when one leaks. <laughs> <I'll bet. laughs> really? Wow, wow. The Takes radio your equipment, away. they had, um, the radio was used for communication not only with uh, ship, other ships, but uh, um, ground stations, weather reports, um, 1,000 watt transmitter. What about those radio bands? That, I'm not sure what the significance of that. To radio navigation, what was the range? You know? I don't know. It would be based on the power, right? They used these radios for mm -hmm. navigation. They had a 70 watt emergency <coughs> generator that would run on generator or batteries. Now, the antenna was amazing to me 120 meters, so that's what? 360. <laughs> that's all long. And if, you had to, it would, if the electric motor failed, you'd have to crank it in and out by hand, I guess, because you couldn't land with it. Hmm. Um, okay, now I want to talk a little bit about, well, we'll talk about first the uh, in one transatlantic uh, trip, the radio room uh, sent 484 private messages, telegrams, and 160 press telegrams. Now, stamp collecting, that was really big. I don't know if anybody <coughs> here is a stamp collector, but it was a very popular stamp. Unfortunately, they were very expensive. I was reading this morning that um, it was during the 1930, which was just a couple years later, the U.S. was in the Great Depression. Only 7% of the stamps were ever sold. These were American stamps. So the United States Post Office Department paid the Zeppelin $100,000 for using these stamps to transport mail, even though only 7% were actually sold. The rest of them were scrapped. But the United States still paid Graph <coughs> Zeppelin Company, $100,000. Hmm. Now, the passenger accommodations. These are actually like Pullman-type cars, like when we're on trains. I think in the Hindenburg, the sinks were in each room and fold down. But in this, you had to go down to the end of the corridor. And uh, the, the beds would fold up, I guess, at night. Otherwise, be a sofa. Hmm. This is the dining room, <coughs> sitting room. I don't think they had a smoking room on this. On the, on, 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 the Hindenburg, on the Hindenburg, they did have a smoking room. But on this one, they did not have a smoking room, which is a good idea. 
Now, the amazing thing to me is in 1929, they had this round the world um, flight, wow. and uh, William Randolph Hearst was a big backer. There were other Americans, wealthy Americans, supporting this. Um, and it started at, and at Lakehurst, so, which is pretty neat. Huh. Huh. Right in our own state. Wow. It, it took three weeks, but the flying time was only 12 and a half days. So it left Lakehurst, went to Germany, crosses Russia, China, all the way to Tokyo, and then back across the Pacific to Los Angeles, and across 13 states back home to Lakehurst. Hmm. Wow. And there's another diagram. Hmm. And here's a picture of in Los Angeles, August 26, 1949. Hmm. Now let's watch the videos. Okay, the first one gives a quick history of how they got to the On July 2nd, 1900, a feisty Count Ferdinand von Zeppelin staked his fortune and reputation on a crazy idea. Three years before the Wright brothers' first flight, the Count's first rigid airship took flight over Lake Constance in southern Germany. It flew for 18 minutes and a distance of three and a half miles. The LZ-1 for Luftschiff Zeppelin 1 was 416 feet long, 38 and a half feet in diameter, and had a lifting capacity of more than 27,000 pounds. How did he do it? Rather than fill one airbag with hydrogen as his predecessors had, the Count inflated 17 large gas cells and enclosed them in a rigid aerodynamic structure of <coughs> aluminum alloy or duralumin. The airship was powered by two engines with a combined horsepower of a Volkswagen Beetle. At the turn of the century, it was the invention of the internal combustion engine that helped make the Count's dream of a rigid airship a reality. But they were expensive to build. The German military said if uh, Count Zeppelin can keep his uh, airship in the air for 24 hours endurance, uh, that they would be willing to purchase then his next airship. During one 24-hour endurance flight, Count von Zeppelin experienced engine trouble and put the airship down near the Daimler engine works and went to lunch. It would prove fortuitous. In the meantime, a storm came and blew the airship away. Uh, <laughs> most unfortunate for the Count because it didn't fulfill his 24-hour endurance re requirement for, for government sponsorship. Um, but what happened was an, a spontaneous flood of donations came from the same people to help pay for the next airship. He received about seven and a half million gold marks from the loss of his ship to, uh, and uh, from all the donations that came in uh, to, to build the Zeppelin company and to build the future airships. That was a technical marvel. As the Zeppelin began to work the bugs out and began to be used more or less routinely, just before World War I, there was a German Zeppelin a commercial service called the Daylag. The different Zeppelins in the Daylag were making what we would call joy rides. You have to remember, aviation was totally new, and people really have paid their, for their flights simply to have a bird's eye view of the city or town which they lived in. What's interesting to note, though, is a number of the passengers were not Germans. The enthusiasm of taking a flight on an airship had reached all, virtually every corner of the world. By 1914, the Daylog airships carried more than 34,000 passengers, over 100,000 miles, without a single accident. It was an economical success. <laughs> With the start of World War I, the Daylog commercial service came to an end, and Zeppelins were used for military purposes. The Zeppelin was touted as the great secret weapon that was going to revolutionize warfare. The German rigid airships reigned supreme. Capable of flying above 11,000 feet, they were well out of the range of ground-based anti-aircraft guns, and not a single airship was lost to enemy fire. The German military ordered 26 airships during the first year of the war and the Zeppelin company went into high gear. They were producing a rigid airship basically every two weeks uh, mm. off of one of the factories somewhere in Germany. Uh, it takes a million rivets uh, to produce one airship. 
it also takes 700,000 skins, that is the internal intestines of, of a cow, uh, to make all the gas bags for one airship. It was a huge wartime effort. Zeppelins were used by the German military for reconnaissance, as well as bombing raids over Great Britain. They were above the clouds oftentimes. Uh, they did try using radio as a means of navigation. And many a raid took place by a Zeppelin in which the commander would report that he raided this place or that place, and he was nowhere near. There was no bombing in Yankers. On the other hand, the airships did a uh, large amount of reconnaissance work, basically flying over the sea, watching out for the British Navy. This guy was really brave. As the war escalated, the Germans built lighter and lighter airships, capable of operating at an altitude of 20,000 feet. Frustrated by their lack of rigid airship technology, the British concentrated on building fighter planes capable of climbing to 22,000 feet. The ammunition that could bring the high-flying Zeppelins down. The thing that really did the airships in uh, during the First World War was the development by the British of the so-called incendiary bullet. A bullet like this hitting an airship filled with hydrogen meant one bullet was all it took to bring an airship down in flames. It was not the great Zeppelin airships that revolutionized warfare in World War I. Instead, it turned out to be a small incendiary bullet. Mm. Wow. In March of 1917, at the age of 78, Count von Zeppelin died. Two Zeppelins dropped flowers as his coffin was lowered into the earth. At the end of World War I, the great German Zeppelin company was forbidden from building any more airships by the Treaty of Versailles. The remaining Zeppelin airships were to be divided up among the Allies. But the German airship crews uh, basically destroyed the majority of the airships in their hangars before the treaty went into effect. The airships that the Germans did give over, for example, to the French, they didn't give them the technology as to how to operate them and how to maintain them. That they kept unto themselves. Hmm. By 1921, the United States was interested in getting its own airship. They ordered a British-built version of the high-flying German airships. And during the final stress test at sea, the R-38 snapped in two, hmm. killing 44 sailors. Hmm. The airship's light frame buckled under the pressure of high-speed turns. Despite considerable apprehension from the Allies, the United States ordered an airship from the cash-strapped Zeppelin Company as part of war reparations. The ship was to be delivered in 1922. In the meantime, the Americans decided to build their own airship. They would call it the Shenandoah. During the war, a German Zeppelin came down in France, and the Allies had a chance to inspect it. Uh, this was the L-49, and as a result, uh, they generated some drawings. The Navy acquired these drawings and basically built their own Zeppelin in Philadelphia. The technology was, was very much World War I technology on the Shenandoah. Uh, there were some American uh, refinements and improvements, and of course it flew with helium, not hydrogen. Helium is an inert gas first discovered in a few Texas oil wells. In 1922, the gas was in short supply and very expensive. And even though helium provided less lift than hydrogen, its primary advantage was that it does not burn. The golden age of airships had begun. The Shenandoah's first flight from Lakehurst, New Jersey, marked the beginning of the era of American rigid airships. Americans were enchanted by the ship's flights around the country. She was hailed as the forerunner to a commercial passenger airship. However, her service was cut short. In 1925, the Shenandoah got caught in a severe Midwest thunderstorm and broke in half. The 210-foot-long forward section carrying seven men shot up to 10,000 feet. Lieutenant Commander Charles Rosendahl figured he could fly what was left of the airship under the same principles as a balloon. By dumping gasoline and valving off helium, he was able to fly what was left of the ship for almost two hours before the forward section of the Shenandoah crashed. While badly injured, Rosendahl and his six men survived. Fourteen others died. <coughs> okay, so that's a little background. Um, next one is uh, the Graf Zeppelin. 
flying after leaving uh, New York and going back to Germany and the Soviet Union, I believe he says. We're flying over the remains of the war where our compatriots lie buried, having died in the mass slaughter of a heroic struggle. World leaders are still talking about the German reparations that are to last for the next 59 years. There's a view from the camera. 1989. Fly over Ypres and Verdun. German crew members drop a wreath for their fallen compatriots. The water of the Bodensee and the small town of Friedrichshafen lie in the distance on the horizon. They're standing all the time. Hmm. The Zeppelin is Germany's national showpiece, says Captain Lehmann. The money to build it was raised by the German people. The airship is a symbol of national unity. This is their airship, he says. Their Zeppelin has come home. the journey and flies from New York to New York. This might have been the part of the round the world trip. You and I were alive then. Yeah. <laughs> Look at how they're refilling the hydrogen. Talk the about a dangerous job. Look at there this. There's a complete fuss about Commander Eckler. In a talk he gave, he said that the Graf Zeppelin is actually out of date that Germany is working on a technically more advanced airship. Some of the passengers are highly agitated. No wonder the most dangerous stage lies ahead of us. We're not referring to Berlin or the plains of Poland. 
but to the vast Look at the way desolate on here. expanse of Russia and Siberia. We have fuel for 150 hours to get us across 11,000 kilometers. What do you One think passenger just gives a radio up? interview full of self-importance. I want to consult some fellow lawyers before I say that microphone break. Yeah. Ekman addresses yeah. us. He is honest and direct. He has spoken to Stalin's staff. Russia has opened her gates so that we may fly over her vastness. This is an expedition. Ekman will give his life for our safety. smooth ride, but I think it's very noisy. Don't you think? Very noisy. Now we're heading for Berlin. Everybody is happy to be on the move again and eager to see Berlin. That woman was hired by um, uh, Hearst as a uh, correspondent. <coughs> In the last hour, the city has become thronged with people. The traffic is chaotic. Businesses have shut down for the day. People are standing on every flat roof. message back from Hearst. You better prepare yourself, girl, for a splendid reception in New York. Gosh. 
What a glorious moment. The airship salutes our Statue of Liberty. Flat iron building? Cigarette. Yeah, absolutely amazing. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that tastes good. <laughs> now, the airship's going through this. Wow. Oh, what is that? Oh. Smoke? Okay. Oh. Yeah, skywriter. Yeah. Oh, maybe it's cloud seeding. Yeah, well, well, that might quite a few officials stand. Yeah, that might be the moments that in that crowd, Bob? It might be. It would be, right? Wilkins and Lane are the first to disembark. They are given a hero's welcome. received two ticker tank parades in New York. Hmm. One when he brought the uh, 1924, when he brought the uh, Los Angeles war preparations, and then this one, this time. Hmm. I think that's the, the woman that William Randolph Hearst hired to cover the media. Celebrities on board and on the
Here we are now in front of City Hall, waiting for the parade to start. And millions of people are waiting. Look at all the hats. Wow. Everybody has that hat. Oh, yeah. Same hat. Yeah. 1920s, right? Yeah. Okay. This is all before the Nazis took over Germany, realizing there was a lot of friendship with Germany at that point. Okay, the last video is um, it's, uh, showing, going over England, um, let's see what else, England, the Swiss Alps, Russia, the Arctic, and then back to Berlin. It's got good, good sound effects. This is the last one. Boop. This is Eckener. I invite them to take a trip with me over the beautiful Switzerland. Takes you for an air ride over the Swiss Alps in the Graf Zeppelin. These are the first sound pictures made on board this giant of the skies. Mm. After a bell signal from the commander, the motors are started and we're off. <laughs> you are witnessing a flight of the Graf Zeppelin in the Swiss mountains. And uh, the, the mountains which you see just now passing by are the Kurfürsten, Lee of Martins, near the Sintis.
and the leaf filling with hydrogen. These are the best pictures taken in Russia by a foreign organization with permission of the Soviet authorities. The shadow of the great monster makes a striking picture against the steady background of Russia's forest land. Within the envelope, the crew moves freely to and fro. An airlock is dropped to gauge the ground speed of the vessel. Approaching Archangel, our cameraman takes up a perilous position to shoot the front of the control room. Below is Archangel, which lives largely by lumber, but is iced down for many months of the year when the White Sea is closed to shipping. On again, and we are now in the area of Pekite. Within the gondola, we begin to feel the cold. An Arctic kit is done, but there is no privation. The Zeppelin carries food in abundance, and Dr. Egner, amongst others, makes a hearty meal. The scientists are busy shooting the sun by six and checking their calculations. We are headed for Franz Joseph land where we have a rendezvous with the icebreaker, Maligin, which is searching for traces of the lost explorer, Amundsen. The airship descends in order to hand over supplies and greet the members of the expedition. Among them is the Italian exile, Nobile, who accompanied Amundsen in the first flight over the North Pole and commanded the fatal attempt of the Italian dirigible, Itala, to do what the Grand Brooklyn is now doing, the ice barrier. Now the Zeppelin is over the scene of her quest. Uncharted Professor Samoilovich, the chief scientist of the party, is busy mapping new lands and demapping old ones. The Zeppelin discovered that some Arctic islands, which we affectionately regarded as British, were only agglomerations of ice. They used the airship to map part of the Soviet Union. In the wireless room, the operators vainly try to send assurances of safety to the inhabited world. But the rays of the midnight sun have killed every short wave. We return along the northern shore of Siberia and come upon a lonely wireless station at the delta of the Yenisei River. We decide not to descend again, so we drop food and mail by parachute. There are only six men and no women in this last outpost of the Soviet Republic on the fringes of the Arctic Circle. And so, the task accomplished, back to Arcane. <laughs> and to Berlin, with its cheering crowd. <laughs> Scouts helping out. <laughs> This is her fourth flight to America, and she has flown 275,000 miles all over the globe. So she knows her way about, and she certainly knows how to land. 
which you can get. A veteran commander, Dr. Ekner, uh, comes down the ladder something. and is greeted by Pfizer officials. Dr. Ekner piloted the Graf Zeppelin around the world in 1939 and has successfully flown 17,000 persons on more than 250 flights. A brief rest and then she's off again on her way to Chicago where she circles over the world's star. The swastikas are on one side, so what they do is they deliberately turn the aircraft around so that it would not be visible to you. She takes a look at the sky ride and on over the planetarium. Finally, after a complete survey of the exhibition, the giant airship lands again, once more with the utmost ease and grace. That was in Chicago. The Zeppelin, whose successful flights all over the globe have made her the most famous dirigible in the world, is showing herself up and down the length and breadth of Germany. At the Tempelhof Aerodrome, Berlin, an enthusiastic reception by the vast crowd is assured. Under the present regime, she is, of course, sporting the swastika. As she leaves the ground, a glider passing beneath the giant airship is released and expresses the joyful sentiments of the occasion by a loop. So, Pering is the one who ordered all the dirigibles to be destroyed, and the uh, metal was used for the war machine. Wow. Also, the day after the dirigible uh, disaster, this, this dirigible was also grounded and decommissioned. So, if that hadn't happened, I think it would have lasted a few more years, because it was the only means of large-scale uh, passenger transportation, other than ship. The uh, passenger planes were not developed yet, right? I wonder how it handled in a big storm, though. Well, that's why they had five V-12 engines. They had, had a lot of horsepower to keep it against the wind, right? Mm -hmm. I read one disaster. It was uh, actually on the second trip across the Atlantic. It got as far as uh, Mediterranean, and they lost two engines. They turned back over France. They lost two more engines. Oh, so they had only one engine working. They started drifting out to the uh, Atlantic, <laughs> and they did emergency landing off the coast of France. Otherwise, they would have been lost mm. in the Atlantic. Mm. So, that's all I got. Oh, all right. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. If you're interested in what it cost, it cost to go from Germany to uh, Rio in Brazil, it cost five hundred ninety dollars. How much? 590, uh, that's 1,500 Deutsche Mark, equal to $10,600 today. So only the wealthy were able to buy it. So you confirmed. There's a rumor going around that the Giants may fire Gettleman today. Say that again. Um, okay. Does that count? <laughs> okay. Boom. <laughs> well, exactly. Buffalo, they're about the hydrogen <laughs> containment. The yeah. Skins yeah, did everybody oh, catch that? Oh, the, the way they held yes. the uh, gas in with the, the, the intestines of yeah, well, that was at the beginning. Well, at the end, they way. came up with a fabric with aluminum powder and... Right, the so. Americans, they worked with Goodyear Tire Company, Goodyear yeah. company and so they called the rubber coating. Yeah, because yeah. hydrogen can go through practically anything. But the Germans were using cow intestines and they uh, would slaughter all that cow. Mm. Okay, so... Mm. I want to thank everyone for coming. Stu, thank you for doing this.